All right, hey, listen, uh, this morning we have in the studio singer-songwriter Tommy Morrison, country, uh, rock, and espanol. He's got two CDs out, right, Tommy? Yeah, that's right. One's called Otro Vest. The other one is called The King of the City. And uh, welcome to Radio Caravan, my friend. Oh, yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. You know, you came to my attention through Keith Taylor. Yeah, Who's yeah. a uh, sound engineer. He has a recording studio here in Orange County. Yeah. Uh, he's worked with a lot of major artists over the years. Yes, he has. Yeah. And I reached out to him and I said, you know, who could you recommend from your cachet of artists that uh, might want to be interested in coming in the show. And yours was uh, the first name that came up. So oh, That's really nice. I appreciate it. Yeah, Keith's a great guy. Yeah. yeah. He's got a studio in Fountain Valley, and he's worked with yeah, he's worked with Sinatra to Bowie, Dylan, and on down to me. Yeah, is, is it true he's cousin to some uh, James Taylor? Yeah, he's James Taylor's first cousin. Yeah. So I always hear musicians are always first cousins to somebody. Yeah, well, they both grew up playing, and they and Keith plays and sings too, but he, he ended up being more interested in engineering and the sound and yeah. doing the work of the recordings. So. Yeah, and he's great, by the way. Yeah, he he's does great. great work. So you're a local Orange County singer-songwriter. Yep. Two CDs out I just mentioned. You've toured with Jennifer Lopez and Mark Anthony. Is that true? Yeah, well, we did show in uh, Irvine Meadows, which is now, what, Verizon Wireless? Uh -huh. Yeah, I travel so much, I forget what, when the names change at these places. But yeah, yeah we did uh, 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 Super Estrella, which is another station. They do a big Reventone, big party, and we did, uh, did a show there with like 12 major artists from the Latin music. Wow. Yeah. So are you more known as sort of a Latin musician or? Um, kind of both. I've always done English rock all my life, but then I learned Spanish and I moved out here from Chicago and started uh, being able to use my Spanish in here in California, like everyone, you know, there's so many Latinos here. So I started getting completely fluent in it, and then I learned about the Spanish rock music and their pop music, and everyone that was my friend and that was Latino kept kind of urging me and pushing me to do Spanish rock. So I wrote a couple songs and just sent it out to a conference one year, and about three months later, I get a call that I'm in the charting and the radio all over the country. I'm like, what the heck is this? And it was wow. quite a surprise. Yeah. So I kind of ran with it, did a complete CD, and then it took off more. And we, we had three top ten hits, and we toured all over Latin America and Mexico, went to Spain, did all that stuff. And so now I came back in this past year, uh, well, actually to 2013. I hadn't recorded in English for a while, so I had all these songs built up, and I'm like, you know, that I've been writing. So I'm like, let's do it. So we went with Keith, and we did one new Spanish CD and one new... English CDs. So. Wow, which is yeah. probably unheard of in a lot of ways, where somebody comes out with two CDs at the same time, and it's yeah. not the same songs on both CDs. They're no, I don't entire... cheat. I yeah. write Spanish music for that market. Yeah. I write the country for that market. And I write my rock for the rock market. So yeah, yeah. are you Latino yourself? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, you did the Ancestry.com thing. You never know. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering why you decided to learn Spanish and then to go from learning Spanish to actually it, performing and singing and recording in Spanish. It, had to have been a difficult transition. Uh, it was a fluke. It was scary, I'll tell you that. When they put me in front of 20,000 people and I had to talk and manage a crowd in, in, in another language, Yeah. it got, yeah, it was pretty, I was like, boom, my heart was going like, okay, can I do this, you know? But yeah, yeah. I just jumped in, started swimming in the water and, and did it, you know? Well, this one is uh, one of the songs that we, uh, we threw in the pot for the Grammys this year, so keep your fingers crossed. It's called right. You and Me. It's one of the English songs off the new CD. And uh, yeah, here you go. That sounds great. Sitting here by myself Wishing I was somewhere else Thinking about how you been And if I could, you know I would Take back everything And do it all again Just close your eyes And we just might find You and me Now some may say Love is blind this happens all the time It's just not meant to be But now and then Again and again It all comes back to me There was 
sometimes hard to see So just close your eyes And we just might find It's you and me Hi, I'm David Wilhelm, and this is Jimmy's Famous American Tavern. Jimmy's has been called a casual comeback for me. I think that's because most of the restaurants that I developed in the past were white tablecloth, upper-end restaurants. Jimmy's was designed as a place for friends and families to gather and enjoy regional American comfort food in a casual setting. Jimmy's Famous American Tavern. Simple and traditional. We're transitioning over to a new in-studio guest. And Jim, you want to go ahead and take it from here? Yeah, thanks, Scott. Uh, we're really happy this morning to have the CEO of Mission Hospital, Ken McFarland, with us. Um, Ken and I have known each other for a few years through my involvement on the board of uh, Mission Hospital Foundation. Um, and I've gotten to know Ken, and uh, we've worked together very closely over the last few years on some very challenging issues as the world of healthcare changes. And so, very excited this morning, Scott, to have Ken with us in studio. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Ken, welcome, by the way. <coughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Hey, you know, I was reading this uh, online. You are a not for profit medical facility. Do I have that correct? Absolutely. With campuses in Mission Viejo and Laguna Beach. Yes. The largest hospital in Orange County? We are the largest. Hospital in all of Orange County, providing more than our two campuses, providing more than forty million in charity care annually. Do I have those statistics right? You do, you do, Scott. That's impressive. Yeah, it's. I feel privileged and pretty blessed to be part of an organization that cares so much about its community. We're about healing people when they make their way to our facilities, but we're also about keeping people well so they don't have to come to Mission Hospital, and that's part of uh, our investment back into the community with those contributions yeah a couple other areas Scott you may not Please. be aware of um, one of the, the the great sources of, of care in South Orange County is the Camino Health Center not a lot of people know about that and its affiliation with mission yes. and tell us about the Camino Health Center yeah so we founded the Camino Health Center a little over 30 years ago and uh, the Camino Health Center is all about taking care of those who can't take care of themselves the underserved and those that are on the margin we see about 125 130 thousand uh, women, infants, and children every year. And uh, we look at it as a great safety net to make sure that uh, everybody in our community, even those without a voice, are cared for. That's beautiful, yeah. It's a, it's a great facility right down uh, in San Juan Capistrano, just mm -hmm. down the street from the Mission. Yeah. And what that does is it allows a lot of people that would ordinarily show up at the ER at Mission or at Laguna Beach to actually have a place where they can go, mm -hmm. um, which frees up the other two locations for you know dealing with more acute issues. Yeah. So. Uh, I got some silly questions. I'm a silly guy. I love it. <laughs> Why do you call them campuses? Campuses. That's a great question. No one has ever asked me that question. <laughs> From my it's perspective, a <laughs> it's, a, it's a way to give people a comprehensive feel so that when they come on and off our property, they see something bigger than themselves. It's a campus, and when you think about a college campus, many things are happening. You got your liberal arts, you got your sciences, you got your engineering. At Mission Hospital, we have our emergency rooms, we got our operative environments, we got trauma. We deliver 3,000 babies a year. Hmm. We do it all. And so it has that kind of campus feel. We don't do just one thing, we do many things. Okay, that's great. That's a great answer. And I knew it was going to kind of throw <coughs> you off a little bit. I but love I, don't, it. I don't think I've ever seen a hospital that referred to its facilities as campuses before. That's yeah. why I, I think it's part of the reason, too, is everyone knew about Mission Hospital and Mission Viejo, but then with the affiliation relationship with the Laguna Beach <coughs> facility, all of a sudden you've got one hospital, two locations, let's call them campuses. Not a lot of people know about the history of the relationship with Laguna Beach. Obviously, South Coast Medical Center has been here forever. Can you tell people in this community especially a little bit about Mission's relationship with Laguna Beach and how that all came about? Absolutely. We, um, over the years, I've been at Mission Hospital for 16 years now, and I've seen a lot of owners come and go uh, in their stewardship of the South Coast Medical Center. And we saw an opportunity to create a, a permanent uh, kind of tenant, if you will, in terms of Mission Hospital. We acquired it 64 months ago. And that's our hope. We've been making an extraordinary amount of investment in that uh, facility. 
we want this community to know we're here for the long haul. And the reason why we acquired that hospital is it does something we don't do. And we wanted one plus one to equal three in terms of our outreach. And what great uh, care that happens at Laguna is enhanced by behavioral and mental health services. There's a very, very um, uh, big issue with mental health, with addictions and the like, that nobody's addressing in South Orange County. We thought, what a great opportunity. Let's show up that campus. Let's make some very notable investments and grow the programs for mental health and behavioral health within South Orange County, caring for our community. So you talk about investment. What kind of investment are we talking about at Laguna Beach? Well, when I describe it, it'll feel like duct tape. So we, we bought the campus <laughs> 64 uh, months ago. Uh, in the walls, in the basement, behind the scenes, there's a lot of things that needed care. HVAC, boilers, uh, shoring it up so it could withstand any type of earthquake. We call that seismic. We've poured almost $30 million into that campus since we acquired it. I call that the duct tape. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to beautify the, uh, the feeling in which you come onto that campus and feel like you're at any uh, world-class facility getting the best care, whether you're suffering from behavioral or mental health services, or you have an emergency need and you can come to that emergency department and get the best in care, the greatest technology, and the most advanced uh, practices in medicine. You know, let me ask a question. I'm going to back up just one half a step to my simple mind. <coughs> how exactly does the not-for-profit model work, and how do you go about raising funds? That's a great question. Um, when people think about not-for-profit, uh, I think the, the visual people have is you're, you're living on a dime. You're making it check-to-check, -check, kind of payroll-to-payroll. -payroll. We actually are very blessed, and we do very well economically. Uh, our commitment as a not-for-profit, as a faith-based organization is, those monies that we would normally pay in taxes, whether it's income taxes, property taxes, and the like, we reinvest in the community. We take care of our community. We want to be great stewards so that what, uh, to whom much has been given, much is expected. We want to make sure that we keep our facilities running very, very well, invest in the greatest and the most advanced technology. But we, with those surpluses, want to reinvest into the community to make sure that um, all needs are met regardless of your ability to pay. So when people come to our emergency departments, we see 72,000 emergency room visits a year, about 2,000 trauma visits, and we deliver about 3,000 babies a year. The majority of all those visits, all those encounters, are with those who can't afford to care for themselves. And so we, uh, we supplement that. To make things really great, because we are a great institution with two great campuses, uh, we go out into the community, because we are in a community with those who have much, and we walk side by side with those very philanthropic, uh, very generous and kind people in our community. And they give generously to Mission Hospital and Mission Hospital Laguna Beach. And we take those monies, and we take great, uh, great health care, and we step it up a notch. And we make great investments in the latest technology around imaging, the operative environments, um, and just the physical uh, surroundings that uh, we call our two campuses. What percent of your budget comes from the money you raise, and how much do you raise annually? We raise approximately 10 to $12 million a year, which speaks to the generosity of this community. And that represents about, um, of our operating budget, our operating budget is over $500 million a year. So that's, that's the, uh, the, the ratio. But what we see is it takes a lot of health care to, to get a margin. And our margin is about 5%. So when you get support philanthropically, you can do so much more. Yeah, I know one of the things that Recently, you just announced uh, and had your grand opening of the Neuroscience and Spine Institute, which I've been working with Jan. Uh, that was an over $20 million project, and our foundation raised money to make that happen, right? Yeah, we are. Uh, so if you think about uh, the Mission Viejo campus, we have a tower, uh, a four-story tower, completely dedicated to neuroscience and spine. The second floor, which just got completed, is a set of operative suites in an environment to provide neuroscience surgery. So that's uh, surgery of the brain, surgery of the spine. It was a $22 million investment. We handle everything from general corporate formation, partnership, real estate. We have a full service litigation practice. And we also have a group of lawyers that handle bankruptcy and general insolvency matters. We offer big firm experience with a small firm feel. The person that you're hiring is the person who's going to be representing you throughout your entire map. 
The slogan of redefining full service attempts to capture two things. One, an explanation of the breadth or the diversity of the legal services that we provide, but also to recognize that our service to our community does not end with our legal services. Whether it's a pro bono opportunity where we're representing people for free, or whether we're actually volunteering on a project like Habitat for Humanity, for example. It includes the philanthropic efforts, the volunteering of time, and the donating of resources outside just the four corners of this law office. We're here with Ken McFarland, CEO of Mission Hospital. Ken, big challenges in healthcare right now, obviously with the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. Uh, lots of things going on in your world. A lot of challenges. Um, how do you deal with it right now? What are the, some of the things you're facing there at Mission? Well, I got to tell you, I, I tell anybody considering health care and coming into this environment, it, it's certainly not for the faint of heart. And you got to have a really uh, courageous outlook because it's so important. Everybody needs health care. And what we don't want to do and what we don't want to have happen, as I shared earlier, is approach this from a position of fear and limitation. And think about not let, allowing ourselves to to lower to a level of mediocrity, which I think some would say has happened to our public school systems. Right. You kind of you take it down. And what we want to do is we want to elevate it. We want to bring a lot of awareness to it. And it's critically important that our community participate with us, walk side by side with us. They can volunteer. They can, they can open up their checkbook. Whatever those gifts, talents, and treasures they have uh, are critical because as I share, this is their hospital. It's where their children are going to be born. It's where their loved ones might pass away. It's where uh, emergency care is so critical. When the uh, affordable health care came into its own January 1st, millions of people all of a sudden had access to health care, so they thought. But what they did get, they got an insurance product. They didn't get a medical home. They didn't get a physician, and not necessarily even a hospital. So the emergency rooms are getting kind of clogged. So what we want to do is kind of put a net out there uh, we're partnering with a lot of like-minded physicians and get the community's physician response with us. So we place a lot of primary cares, a lot of nurse practitioners in the community, meet the patients where they are, not necessarily have them come into the, into the hospital on an emergency basis, an episodic basis, and keep them well and practice a lot of good wellness um, uh, uh, patterns around diet, exercise, and self-care which is absent in the Affordable Health Care Act. Interesting. So one of the things I know that, that has happened in, is, is this affiliation process where you say that the hospital is important to individuals. They want to know it's their hospital. Yet in order to deal with the marketplace, it seems like you're kind of going the other direction and expanding and, and becoming a bigger thing with these affiliations. Talk about that. When I, when I put my head on the pillow each and every night, I realize I'm part of something bigger than myself. And that, that helps to give me courage and it puts a little bit of wind in my sail. So thinking about health care, thinking about our county, knowing that you might live in Mission Viejo, but you might work in Orange, knowing you might live in Orange, but you might work in Newport Beach, we try to, through our affiliations, kind of expand our opportunities of providing care. So we, St. Joseph Hogue Health, are part of St. Jude's in Fullerton, St. Joe's Orange in Orange, and now Hogue in Newport Beach, and now Hogue Irvine together with Mission Hospital and Mission Hospital Laguna Beach. We've tried to create a net so that uh, no matter what your geographic disposition, you're going to get great care. And these are great institutions. Every now and then we have challenges, but together we're stronger. It's like a band of, of six threads coming together. Uh, you're very polished, by the way. You should get into politics. <laughs> uh, have you ever considered getting into politics? No, I, I, I have too many wise people around me preventing me from doing so. Well, that's good, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but you, you really are polished. You speak well, and, and, and uh, I can see where you're really effective in your job. Your facility ran into a, a little bit of a, a, a hiccup here recently, and I don't yeah. want to undermine sort of the severity of the issue. Uh, you put elective surgeries on hold, about 70% of your total surgeries recently. You voluntarily closed 14 operating rooms after four patients developed infections following orthopedic operations, and there were some concerns about your accreditation. So I'm going to allow you to sort of define for us what the problem was, and then maybe articulate how you went about s dealing with it. Thank you. And, and Scott, thank you for uh, putting that out there. 
I, I can't begin to describe how many sleepless nights I had a, as a result of that very difficult time. In healthcare, we actually have as an outcome goal, perfect care. Sounds audacious, it sounds a little arrogant, but we want perfect care. And we want anybody and everybody coming on and off our facilities, our two campuses, to have great confidence and great trust. And so late May, early June, when it came to our attention, we had this cluster, these, these infections. And, and let, me, let me set some context. We do about 20,000 procedures a year. When I think of our 14 operative environments, uh, we actually have 15, excuse me, 15 operative environments <clears throat> over our two campuses. We have two main ORs, one in Laguna and a main OR in Mission Viejo, but we have other operative environments where we do um, cath lab procedures, uh, GI procedures, we deliver uh, babies via C-section and so on. So in these 15 operative environments, the infections took place at one OR, we call it room eight on the Mission Viejo campus. We brought in the smartest and brightest people we could find from an infectious disease perspective to help us understand how did this occur. We looked at every aspect of the environment from the vents to the cleaning materials we use to how people come into the operating room. We, we swabbed them and tested them to look at was there a correlation by those who worked in the OR? Was there a correlation, was it a one single physician? Was it uh, a humidity or a temperature issue in the OR? And these very, very smart people said, we cannot find any correlation. Infections do happen, as you saw uh, in, in subsequent reporting by the Orange County Register. It's a very difficult environment to keep absolutely perfectly clean. We had this cluster. We self-reported. In the early part of October, some very smart people from the Joint Commission came on out in partnership with us and said, you know, you've got these 15 operative environments and you manage them in a decentralized manner you should consider a, uh, a centralized approach, a centralized leadership over it. We, out of a, 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 what I'd call an abundance of caution, said, you know what, let's pause, let's stop doing the electives, let's get everything. I, I would say we operated from a very high standard level of care. We just took our game up a notch. And I'd venture to say we probably have one of the most safest, cleanest operative environments you could possibly imagine. And one last point, if yeah, I please. may, Scott, I, I, I'm sorry if I'm taking all the air out of the room. No. But um, one thing I want to remind everybody is each and every day where we're getting five to seven trauma cases still and operating with great outcomes, we get about 200 emergency room visits each and every day and caring for those people with, with very good outcomes in those operative environments. We just hit the pause button on the electives to free up people's uh, bandwidth to really put a lot of focus and attention. And then 10 days later, we open them all back up. Uh, a very difficult period, I suspect, for, for you and your campuses. Yes. Did you actually self-report, or did an employee come for, uh, forward to report? We actually, uh, those went uh, parallel. And so we had a, 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 a very unhappy employee um, who gave me a letter and said, I'm, I think there's some issues here. And then they gave that same letter to the Joint Commission, the accrediting body. But because whenever we find something like this, we self-report. If a patient falls and there's a bad outcome, because patients fall, you can have a, a, an elderly uh, individual who came to us with a stroke. They may have been trying to go to the restroom. They may have fallen. Uh, we self-report that. Um, if we have any kind of uh, untold outcome, which happens a lot in healthcare, um, you know, we self-report to the regulatory bodies because we want to keep our integrity high and we want the confidence of the community to remain in us. Beautiful. Did the four people who suffered from the infections, I know you can't get into their specific cases, but can you give me, give the listeners, the viewers, an overall sense of how they're doing? Yeah, uh, what I like to sh share is um, uh, we take these things very seriously, the practitioners, the nurses, uh, the families, and through a regimen of very aggressive antibiotics, uh, everybody's okay. Now, did we want it to happen that way? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, and um, I'm, it made me feel very bad. Yeah. And those are what contributes to those sleepless nights. And, and, and the, rep the, the employee who reported the problem used the word unhappy. Uh, was this employee unhappy because of the infections, or was this employee unhappy for other reasons? And what became of that employee? Um, I, I can't speak to that uh, because that, em that employee is on this uh, journey yeah. and uh, for uh, uh, protection purposes. And Got you. We're working through stuff. 
I'm not trying to be evasive. No, that's fine. That's um, fine. I get we're it. We're working through some stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> but I think, um, we, you know, we employ 2,700 people. Right. And uh, it's, a, it's a big community, and we are doing a lot of things. And I think this person wanted more attention in the work area in which she found herself. And guess what? There's a lot of attention happening in that area where she works. What caused the infections then? Did you ever discover what the infections were? And are you installing a new uh, uh, sort of system here? To do yeah. Uh, uh, if you can imagine the attention this received, uh, uh, together with the strength of this broader system, we had our professional colleagues from Hogue, St. Joe's Orange, and St. Jude's come with us. We looked at the entirety of the environment. We could not identify the source, and that happens. People actually bring bugs with them into the operative environment, and it might be inside. So what we did was we um, a approached it and looked at all the uh, air handling. We created a centralized approach for what we call high-level disinfectant. We brought in new equipment for sterilization. We did a lot of training. We did a lot of competencies, and we put in some pretty brilliant practices uh, to make sure we are world class and best in class. Beautiful. I mean, you, you came across a, a very severe problem. You uh, tackled it right away. You seem to have uh, tr did everything, done everything you could to sort of fix the problem. And you feel comfortable and confident that the hospitals are safe and not necessarily completely infection free, but. Uh, if I could share one last comment you may. on that matter. So when the surveyor came back out to kind of make sure we did what we said we would do, uh, and I was staring at that surveyor, it was about uh, 645. Uh, in the evening as we we're exiting the, the meeting and I and I asked her I said point blank would you feel safe having surgery at Mission Hospital and she didn't even hesitate she said yes absolutely it's the right question to ask yes we were talking what's the uh, going on at the campus down in Laguna Beach you yes yeah, so about that Jim I, I know we got that, one minute by yeah the way. so why don't you talk a little bit about what what you have in terms of pediatric behavioral health and, and some of the issues that you're talking about going forward so one of the things that pains me the most as a member of this community is one in four one in four, so we have eight people in this room. Uh, two of us are gonna have a mental health need in the next 12 months and on an annual basis. So look around, one in four. I think April. And, and today, Cyrus. today, unfortunately, <laughs> Wait, what, nobody what? in this community. Let them go, let them go. <laughs> nobody in this community is dealing with uh, behavioral mental health needs. Uh, the adults get care, and it, if they get care, it's difficult to obtain, but nobody is helping our adolescents and nobody's helping our pediatric uh, populations. Those are the young kids. And so we're going to uh, really reinvest in the Laguna Beach campus, not only for the great adult care that's there, but we're gonna introduce behavioral mental health services for adolescents, both psychiatric and chemical dependency, as well as our hope, our hope is to introduce it for pediatrics as well, in addition to the great care we do with emergency medicine, surgeries, and the like. We're very excited about this, and our, and our whole view on this is gonna be, let's take behavioral mental health services out of the shadows and into the light. 